I'm very excited this morning to be beginning a new series with you out of the book of Matthew called The King and His Kingdom. And today we are going to talk about the rightful king. It's really interesting uh, how many of you would agree that uh, when there is an absence of good rulership, things go wrong? And uh, huh, you can take that wherever you want to go. I, um, but I'm just saying that it's true. And the writer of the book of Matthew, Matthew, the disciple of Jesus Christ, wants you to know deeply, passionately, so much so that you will bow your knee in life before Him, that there is a King. And that He has come. Amen? Uh, and it's important that you understand why He's the King. If I could uh, take you into literature just for a moment, I'm not going to read it, but I would take you to a scene. You would come into a glen, and there would be a stone a large boulder, and somehow there's a sword shoved down into this stone. Now you've come to know that there was a wizard by the name of Merlin who shoved it down into that rock magically, and the sword itself was magic. Anybody know the name of the sword? Excalibur. And there's a a truth written on that sword, and I'm going to actually read to you what is engraved on the sword, and it's actually in Old English, and it says, Whoso pulleth out this sword of this stone and anvil is right wise king born of England. How many of you have heard that tale? It's an important tale because it's actually based on the one that we're going to read today. But that's just an aside. Um, it's important because what it is declaring is that the only one who can rule is the one who checks all of the boxes and must rightwise be qualified to rule. Their, their lineage has to mean that they're rightfully the king. Their, their personality means they are rightfully the king. Their characteristics mean that they're worthy to be the king. Everything has to align in order for them to pull the sword from the stone. But that's nothing compared to who has to of all the things that have to align if you would be Messiah, the King of the world. Amen? And so when Matthew begins his Gospel, he is very uh, passionately wanting you to understand that there is a King. And it's God's King. And it's His ruler. And it's His Son. And His name is Jesus Christ. Um, and you need to know that God has chosen a king. That's important for us to me. That means that there is someone whom we're supposed to be. And maybe the most important thing that will happen today is for you to hear this. Your life will make no sense until you bow your knee to the real king. In Psalm 2, the psalmist writes, after talking about the kings of the world, taking their stand, rising up, freaking out, and then God says, but as for me, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. And God wants you to know who this is. And, and, and Matthew is, is literally going to be shouting from, from the gospel that we're going to study. He's going to be shouting the fact that, first of all, there is a king and he has come. Uh, Matthew, of course, is one of Jesus' disciples. Uh, he is a tax collector. And as many of you might have enjoyed the new Chosen series, uh, there is really no proof that that is exactly what Matthew was like. But we do know that he was one of those whom Jesus called. What is interesting is he's a very humble guy. And in his Gospel, he'll never refer to himself first person. Ever. He's always third, he's always secondary, he's always in the background. It's not about him. He wants you to know that there's a king. 
And he literally formats all of Matthew to say this to us. And the first thing we're going to study, and we'll start it today, is that he is the qualified king. Meaning that the king has to have the right credentials and qualifications if he's going to rule. Certainly if he's going to do anything about our lives or the people who need him. He's the authoritative king. Because he's qualified, he has authority where no one else has authority. As we go through the book of Matthew, this is the phrase you're going to hear often. You have heard it said, but I say to you. This is the authoritative king. He is the one who brings meaning to all of the Old Testament. He is the one who has the authority to tell us exactly what God wants. Shockingly and importantly, this is also the rejected king. And how massively important is it that the long-promised thing that God said He would send uh, ended up standing beaten, stripped of His dignity, and hearing the chants of the people He came to rule, crucify Him, crucify Him, crucify Him. So this is also the rejected king. And in his rejection, uh, he actually accomplishes everything he came to do, which is good news for us, because how many of you have rejected Jesus this week? How many of you need to have God be bigger than your sin? Amen? The rejected king. But then this is what's so beautiful about this. He's leading us all to this conclusion. Guess what? This is the returning king. And the beginning of his return comes when he raises to new life from the grave. And then he gives his testimony and his commissioning to all of his disciples. And, and he literally rises up into heaven and he says this great news. And it's news you all need to hear this morning. I'll be back. And when He comes, He will not come in obscurity. He will come as King of kings and Lord of lords, and we will be with Him forever. Amen? Well, that's the story. So we're going to now begin the book of Romans. No, we're, <laughs> I literally feel like, okay, that's the whole thing. If you miss the kingship of Jesus, then you miss the book of Matthew. And there's a lot of good stuff in this Gospel. Anybody ever heard of the Sermon on the Mount? In this Gospel. Lord's Prayer, in this Gospel. Parables, all in the Gospel. So much in here. But everything in this Gospel centers around this issue of, is Christ King? Now, in order for us to get that picture uh, and to teach us this lesson, Matthew's going to start today with the genealogy. I like to think of genealogies as lessons in sanctification. Have you ever come upon a genealogy in your Bible reading? Aren't they fun? <laughs> Isn't it exciting? You know, so-and-so begat, and they begat, and they begat, and they came from this, and, they, and you can't pronounce any of the names anyway. And literally, you're just like, begat, 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 get to the point. No. Two things are going to happen today as we look at the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew 1. Matthew is trying to unlock two things for you. He's trying to unlock the identity and the authority of Jesus Christ. Who is He? And because of who He is, what can He do? That is what a genealogy is literally intended to do. It is to give us a confidence in that this Jesus... And to know who we're talking about. Friends, I would tell you there's a world out there that hasn't read the genealogy. They've made up a Jesus of their own origin and their own making who fits their box and checks their boxes. But God does not write the Gospel for our boxes. He writes the Gospel for His. And His standards are higher than any of ours. If it was up to us, we would never accept Him. If it's up to God, it is His perfection that brings us the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew will show us who He is, and then Matthew will utilize, believe it or not, this genealogy to show you what He has authority over. All of this in a list of names. 
literally the lineage of Jesus as the one and only true Messiah King that there could ever be. And by the way, this is one of the biggest attacks that happens against Christ in the Gospels. That He doesn't have the right to do what He says He can do. And so this is really powerful. And in fact, my prayer today is that at the end of this, you'll all be amening. Not because I did a good job, but because you'll see the majesty of the One we call Savior and Lord. Amen? Amen. So let me read the ending. Because it gives you an explanation of what this genealogy is and how it brackets. Verse 17 of Matthew chapter 1. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation of Babylon to Messiah, 14 generations. Let's pray. God, You do not do things randomly. You know who's in the room this morning. And You know how important it is that they come face to face with Jesus Christ the King. We have no hope if we are left on our own. My prayer today, God, is that not simply knowing who You are, not simply understanding Your authority, but as King, would we bow our knees and our hearts before you. And we pray these things in the name of our King, Jesus Christ. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Look at verse 1. I want you to understand the identity of the one that God says is the King. Verse 1 says, The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus the Messiah. It is interesting, the word Messiah in the Greek means anointed one. The Messiah was the anointed one of God. It is a reference all the way back into the Old Testament of the one whom God has chosen and set apart to be all that He promised and everything that He said He would do in time and history. The Messiah is not a secondary character. The Messiah is the primary character of the Bible. Whoever this person is, this is what the entire book is about. The Anointed One. In fact, in Luke 4, 18, Jesus opens the scrolls in one, before the Pharisees and He says this, He quotes Isaiah, He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on Me because He has anointed Me to preach good news to the poor. And when Jesus read that and then He said, This is being fulfilled in your midst, they picked up stones to kill Him. Why? Because He was saying, I'm Him. I'm the anointed one. Well, that's where this whole... I mean, you've got to imagine Matthew writes a gospel and he starts it by throwing down. Literally, this is not like, oh, here, read a nice story about a, a friendly Jewish prophet who did cool stuff. No, it's like, you have come face to face with Messiah, God. This man says he's God. He's God's Son. He's the anointed one. The whole story is about him. Will you bow? That's where we start. We don't end there. It's not get to the end and go, oh, all hail King Jesus. He says, verse 1, get on your face. How does that fly in our culture? How does that fly in your own heart, which is so fiercely independent? The very first verse and the first words of the New Testament are pancake yourself. Well, who is he? Identity. Literally what is interesting, did you guys notice that he kind of starts weird? Like weird historical order? The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Let me ask you, who lived first? David or Abraham? Why does he start with David? Because the entire genealogy literally centers around the kingship and the throne of David. It is all built upon David and moving out from David. 
Even though it is revealing to us who the Messiah is, Matthew is giving us a lesson that this genealogy has all, it's all about Davidic authority. How many of you know that God made an eternal, everlasting covenant with David? And he said, someone from you will sit upon a throne and he will rule not just in time's existence, out of time's existence, into eternity. How many of you think that's a pretty big promise? Wow. So, this whole thing centers around the fact that whoever has come is the son of David. Meaning, he has the right, legally, to rule and this is the heart of matthew's genealogy this is the true son of david i did this last week and i messed up my notes but now i have them back and i'll keep going Um, if you go into scriptures you will find god's promise to david all over the place But if you want a primary reference and you're writing down notes, write down this, 2 Samuel 7. In 2 Samuel 7, we we record the Davidic covenant that God makes with David. There he says, your house and your kingdom will endure, and everything's fine until he says forever. God makes a promise to a mortal. But his promise is immortal. It's a forever promise. He says your throne will be established forever. And so, the genealogy, and I'm not going to read all the names. Some of you were looking forward to that, just to watch me get low in front of you. I'm not going to do it. No, I'm not doing it. Um, But you need to know that verses 1 through 6, these talk about the origins of David. These are the origins of David's ancestry. Verses 7 through 11 talk about the decline, the rise and the decline of David's household. Historically, you're just following through these people reference. This is like the rise of David's throne and the decline of David's throne. And then finally, in verses 12 through 17, coming back from the Babylonian captivity, it is the descent of David's household into obscurity. Have any of you noticed that when Jesus and I mean when Joseph and Mary show up in Bethlehem, nobody cares. These are both descendants, direct descendants of David the king. These are royalty. Did you see him rolling out the red carpet? There's nothing. It is at that moment the fact that nobody cares. It's not a big deal anymore. The promise of God, like it's forgotten, like you don't matter. Who's your grandpa? It doesn't matter. Literally, this lineage tracks all of that down to a moment in a stable when the Son of God was born. Pretty powerful. So this is amazing because what this this genealogy is telling you that all throughout all of that history, this Jesus is the hope and the king and the answer to this Davidic promise that God had made. I said this before. How many of you know that we are people who desperately need a king? Do you think it's any accident that there have been kings throughout history? Even sinful people know somebody's got to fix this mess. Amen? We get that. Here's the problem. Our sin is total rebellion against any kind of authority. And in case you think that's new, I'll take you all the way back to the end of of, the book of Judges. Did you ever hear this one? There was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Literally, after God had made all these promises, you have the descent of God's people into anarchy. And what was missing? They had no authority. They had no one to rule them, so they did whatever they want. How many of you know that's the spirit of our age right now? I mean, literally... Everybody in our culture is driving around with a bumper sticker that says, vote for me. Isn't that true? Vote for me. I've got this. I know what should be done. If I just had my way and all you idiots would get in line. Oh, did I call you idiots? Wow. How many of you know that sin makes you stupid? (laughs) 
Anybody sin this week? Just say. Apart from Jesus, are we not hopeless? Left on our own? But here is the promise. In the midst of the chaos of the, the descent of Israel into anarchy, along comes Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 says this, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Literally, the Davidic line of kings that has been cut off and left alone. It says a shoot will come up from there and his roots, and from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Meaning what? That God is going to bring from obscurity a king with the right credentials to do something with the mess we've made. Is that good news to anybody? Does that sound familiar? And lo, one day, one will come forth who are, whose origins are from old, whose fathers are Isildur and Anarion. And the sword which was broken when he cut the one ring from the hand of the Dark Lord will be reforged anew. Andriel, king of flame of the west, and he will come forth from obscurity, and Aragon will bring peace to the land. And thus the Lord of the Rings came about. Anybody ever heard that one? Why? Because you've all heard this story in a hundred different forms. Because it's God's story. And it's at the heart of mankind. Sin broke the world. Amen? And what are we longing for? Won't there be? Couldn't someone come? I know it seems so impossible. You know why it seems so impossible? I've so made a mess of this thing. How I many you know that God's never failed His promises, but we have? I have broken every covenant he's ever made in my own life personally. How about you? And you look at the mess and the broken and you're like, who could ever do this? And lo, in the very first pages of the New Testament, in the very first lines, you find the king whose origins are from beginning who checks all the boxes. He is David's son. He's not just David's son. He's Abraham's son. Did you catch that? Oh, this is so good. Because he's not just qualified to be king. You see, if he was just the king and he could just rule on the throne, it would be a temporary thing. But then you go, wait, what? You said Abraham's son? Okay, jump back. We're going further back in Scripture. I'm going to end up in Genesis 12 and Genesis 18. And what am I going to read there? I'm going to read the Abrahamic Covenant. And what will I find when I read the Abrahamic covenant? Genesis 12, 2 through 3. I will make you a great nation, God promised Abraham. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Meaning, Abraham, from your body, from your seed, one will come forth who will bless all of us. God promised Abraham that he'd be given a land, that he would become a great nation, but there was a third one, and it was that through him, through his seed, one would come forth, and all of us would find blessing. That is, quote, for life again. Pretty powerful. Friends, we just got through with the book of Daniel. How many of you know that God protects His people, Israel, because they were the vehicle through whom He would bring Messiah. He chose them from the beginning. They're no more saved than any of us in this room, but we are all saved through the One that came through them. The Messiah. How many of you know Jesus is a Jew? And God brought them and protected them and kept His promises. And all these things aligned so that one would come. How's he going to do that? Well, just like God provided a ram on Mount Moriah for Abraham, God was going to provide a lamb for you and I. Amen? So that this is not just David's son, that somehow this king becomes so much more. He becomes the sacrifice. I just don't want you to miss this, friends. God's... The, I have so much going on in my head. I'm going to get us in trouble. 
The hope of the world is a person. It's not a state of being. It's not world peace. It's Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it. That's it. I think it is telling that this genealogy starts with Abraham begat Isaac. And if you know the Old Testament, it starts with the need for the supernatural provision of God for a son. And guess how it ends? The supernatural provision of God who brings the Son. That's the whole genealogy. That's the whole story. He is Abraham's son. And I think that leads us to the most important thing. This is not just David's son. This is not just Abraham's son. This is the Son of God. It is so significant as you go through this genealogy, gang. When you get to verse 16, it says, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, intermarry, by whom Jesus was born. The grammatical construction of this verse is like a megaphone. What it is saying is that if you have a, a King James here today, you're reading through the begats. And they begat so and so, and they begat, 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 and when they get to the end, but they didn't begat. Because this one came from a different origin. And it's explained as you go down a little bit further in the chapter. Verse 25 makes it very clear that this one was not begotten of man. This one did not have this fallen sin nature of mankind. Why? Because he was born of a virgin, born by the power of the Holy Spirit. So this one is something greater the angel answered and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Whew. Friends, Jesus in this genealogy has His royal right to reign because He is the adopted Son of David. Now some of you are like, wait a minute. Doesn't He have to be from David? Well, just go over into Luke chapter 3 and you can read Mary's genealogy who also happens to be a direct descendant of David. So nothing is being said or missed in this passage, but what they're shouting is like, this is the rightful royal heir of David. That is where he gets his right to kingship. But what is significant here is that while that is his kingship, he has his right to reign as Messiah through his sinless sin nature as the Son of God. So what do you have? You have a very qualified person whose origins go back. If you go to the book of Luke, it takes you all the way back to Adam. This is... This is the king. Now I want to tell you something that was very powerful. If you, if you ever doubt that God can use a genealogy to change someone's life, there's a wonderful ministry. It's called Faith Comes by Hearing. I was introduced to them while I was a pastor in Kansas City. And what they do is they go into areas that have no written recording of the Bible. And they get somebody from that tribe who has learned English. And what they do is they literally give them a mic and they let them read the Bible and they just translate it on the spot into their language. It's not perfect, but they do that. And then what they do is they go into these communities where there's no written Word of God, but now they have a recording on it, and they put it like on one of these Bose speaker boom boxes, and they invite everybody to hear it. This is a story that repeats itself often. Uh, the guy who was telling it, he was there that day that they happened, they brought it, and four villages came together and guess what was the very first thing that they recorded? They record the New Testament, so they start where? The genealogy. Did you know that in that tribal community, the greatest persons are the persons who can trace their, descend, their, their ancestry back the furthest? They literally make you the ruler of the thing if you can go back like six generations seven generations names and dates so literally that they turn this on they have no idea what's about to happen and all of a sudden as the recorder is recording people start moaning and they're dancing back and forth and they just start shaking like this and then 
And literally, the missionary is like, we have messed up. Something's terrible. And literally, in the middle of it, you have four villages of people prostrating themselves on the ground. Because they've never, ever encountered anyone like this. He's not just the son of David. He's not just the son of Abraham. You know what made sense to them before they even got to the end of the genealogy? Was that this was the son of God. And they needed to bow before Him. So where are you at this morning? Because you can search every religion in the world. You can look at every system of somehow trying to justify yourself. And you know what you will never find outside of God's Word is God's Son. And if you never find Him, guess where that leaves you, congregation? You get to be king. You get to save yourself. You get to somehow unravel all of the brokenness of history so you can feel good about the way you're living today. You get to carry the weight of having a plan for your life and every day going forward. And somehow, you must live in such a way that you can give stability to everyone around you out of your great wealth of history. How many of your stories are not that pretty? Or... You can meet Jesus Christ who is the answer of God from the beginning of time and on into eternity. Amen? So quickly, if that is who He is, then you have to ask the question, what does He have authority over? And just by way of breaking this down, you need to understand that if Jesus is all of these things, then Jesus is the answer to all of the promises that God has made from the beginning of Genesis going forward. He answers everything. I love this. I mean, literally, from the beginning, how many of you have ever read in Genesis that one would come who the, the serpent would bruise his heel, but he would crush his head? It meant that someone was going to come along with the authority to deal with sin. And then from that story, everything began to expand. Everything began to grow. And in, 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 in the covenant God made with Abraham, suddenly you have the one through whom all nation, everyone is going to be blessed through him. Then you come through Moses, and you have one who was going to come and be the perfect righteousness of God. And then you, you get David. And David, there's one who's going to come, and he's going to rule and reign. And then you get Isaiah. And then you get Jeremiah. And this one's eventually going to bring a new covenant, and he's going to remove sin so greatly. And he's going to put himself within our hearts. And he's going to make us new forever and every every promise of God in the entire Bible come back to this one and if he is all these things then we have all of the promises of God fulfilled in this king how many of you ever heard of this one second Corinthians 1 20 for all the promises of God find their yes in him that is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. Now, you can get excited about that, but then let's make it very personal. That means that this King is the answer to all of our brokenness. How many of you are a little bit by your pastor? I know there's a lot of problems in the world, but you should see mine. Any of you feel that way? Who's... who's Who's self-focused? Come on, are you with me? We're redeemed. We can be okay with it. I know there's a lot of stuff in the world, but it's my broken that keeps me up at night. And suddenly what you're saying is that there is one who has authority over all of this. This genealogy, oh, oh friends, listen to this. This genealogy is a walk through the brokenness of mankind. Hey, I'm glad God made Abraham some promises. What did they do with those? How did that end up? Well, they spent 400 years in captivity in Egypt, and then they managed to get themselves abused by every nation. They never fully possessed the land. They still don't to this day. Why? Did God mess up? Or did sin enter in? And you have a history full of unending ups and downs and roller coaster rides. 
God made David a promise. I mean, can you imagine me getting that promise? David, I, God of eternity says to you, I make a vow to you that you and your offspring will rule for eternity. What? How many of you might do some more improvements to the palace? Anybody else? Like, let's put in a hot tub. It's gonna, we're going to be here a while. It's just great. But how many of you know how the stories of the lineage of David end? You know where they end? In Babylon. In idolatry. In broken. In sin. And you look at this unfolding uh, picture of history, and it is so stinking depressing. Why? Because we break stuff. How many of you guys know that? Sin breaks stuff. But the question is, does God fulfill His promises because of our faithfulness or despite our unfaithfulness? The fact is, God's promises cannot be thwarted by my broken. Anybody say amen to that? God's promises cannot be thwarted by the reality that sin is being overcome by Jesus Christ. And how many of you know that you were a pretty good sinner at once in a time and you still struggle with it, but how many of you look a little more like Jesus today? Come on, testify. Who's been changed by Jesus Christ? What is that? That is the promise of God. How many of you should not be here today? I'm not saying it's so great to be here. I'm saying, how many of you shouldn't be saved? You shouldn't have a hope. You shouldn't have any confidence. You should be dreading eternity. How many of you shouldn't be here? But you're here. Look around. Somebody say amen. You're saved. Praise God. That, what is that? That's God. Not hindered by broken. In fact, oh, can I just give you this picture for a second? All of our failure leads to the cross. And somehow your God is so great and His promise is so strong that He takes the brokenness of His people Israel, He takes the rejection of the world, and He lets them lead them to the point where we put to death and we actually act as God's tool in bringing about the death of Jesus Christ, which happens to be the only way that we can be forgiven. What does that mean? That means that all of the brokenness of your life does not thwart the God who has put His love upon you through Jesus Christ. That is grace. That is grace. So where does that leave us? What I love is... His accessibility. His accessibility. Now, I, I know this is going to be a little bit of a Sunday school lesson, but let's just imagine we're sitting there. We just got the book of Matthew hot off the presses. Some of you are tanners and fishermen and fisher, you know, you, you've got all your dyes in the purple and we're all looking all old New Testament. Okay, we're there. You with me? And we're sitting there and they pull out the letter of Matthew. And they begin the genealogy, and we're just like, oh, wow. That's who he was. He was the king. He was the king, right? And they start reading through it. And then all of a sudden, as they're reading, they're like, you know, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob. Yes, we, oh, our, our aunt, you know, that's great. And Jacob, he begat Judah. And Judah begat, you know, Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And we're like, Just say Tamar. Did he just say that there's incest in the line of our king? We all know this because we've studied this and we've had a chance, but just imagine the first time the king of the world, the promised Messiah, and you find out that one of his ancestors committed incest. That's part of the story. So we all take a deep breath and they keep reading. We're like, <laughs> I hope we don't have another one of those. But then you keep reading. I'm not going to read the names. <laughs> Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. You're telling me 
there's prostitution in the line of our king. So we got incest, which is horrible. Now we got prostitution. Can this get any worse? Well, it can if you're a Jew. As in he says, you know, and this shocks you, you know, who does she end up, uh, you know, Rahab, you know, Salmon, you know, Boaz by Rahab, that's Rahab, you know, Boaz is Rahab, one of the most godly men in the Bible, Boaz, his mom's a former prostitute, you know, and then, then it says, and Boaz was the father of Obed, who happens to be the grandfather of David, but then you find out that he married a gal named Ruth. She's a foreigner. She's a Moabitess. She's not part of the covenant community. She has no heir. She's no throw. Are you telling me now that I've got incest, prostitution, and foreigners? Not people of the promise? Oh, yeah. Like, could this possibly get any worse? Then David had Solomon, and it tells us by Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. So the very king who God made the covenant with committed adultery to have the promised son come from him. Why do I go into this and why do I get loud, folks? For this reason, the genealogy is marked by gross sin, blatant idolatry, Captivity in Egypt, captivity in Babylon, a succession of flawed kings, hostile enemies, yet it is God's plan that is carried out to completion. He is not hindered by our broken. In fact, on your notes, He is full of grace. Friends, your books are really boring, aren't they? Any of you curl up with your yearbook lately? I was sitting down at Moody Bible Institute and I was sitting in a foyer and I'm waiting for one of my kids and I've got nothing to do and there's this whole line of yearbooks. And I open them. I'm like, wow, a bunch of people. And then I find me. <gasps> I want to like go up to the desk. Hey! <laughs> I was handsome, wasn't I? No, you know, you just, look, I'm in the story. You know why those people are referenced Because you're in the story too. Amen? And whatever you think of your ancestry or where you came from or the brokens of your past or all of the things that should disqualify you, there in the story of God's redemption are we. Amen? That's the awesome truth of this. I was thinking of it this way. Um, And this is hopefully some grace for all of you. I just took down my Christmas lights. And I have a good reason. I am lazy, but that's not the reason. Um, Our house is on a very dark street, and there's just not a lot of light. And so it is so nice when Christmas comes around to just have it all lit up with lights and everything. And and so I'm like, so I don't want to take them down because I like pulling in a nice, warm, pretty, all this kind of stuff. But anyway, when you take down your Christmas lights, I've learned painfully over time to be more careful how I take them down. And I try to wrap them in a certain way so that when I go to get them next year, they just unwrap. Because there have been many years that I have created the tangle box of doom, you know? And you get there and there's these Christmas lights and they are just a big knotted ball. And if you're anything like me, five minutes into unknotting this, I'm like, (laughs) Home Depot, I'm getting new ones. I'm like, I'm not doing this. This is like my life... It is not worth it to me to unravel this. Well, guess what, you big string of lights? Anybody else afraid of the knots you've made? I got some humdingers in this box. And they should disqualify you. And if God is who He is and He loves righteousness and the beauty of holiness, what's the first thing He should do with me? But He's not like that. This King is willing to take the time. And it is His kindness that leads us to repentance. 
and he begins to unravel the broken of your life and mine. And he, he promises us on day one, he gives us this promise at our salvation. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. You are forgiven day one. How many of you still don't feel forgiven though? And you just like, where? And, and he has promised, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. And he is taking that thing apart. And then shock of all shocks, he takes my life and your life. And then he sets it on display in a dark world. To the glory of his grace. Amen. You and I have a king who is not undone by broken. He paid for all of broken, and it is the servant he uses to bring about his story. How many of you know that this king is still drawing people from every tribe and every nation and every story and every broken, and he is the king that they need and the sufficient king for their sin? Do you know that? He's full of grace. So as we close today, the question is very simple. Will you bow? I wish it was different, but I don't. Because the greatest freedom we will ever know is when we bow our knee before this king. He's unlike any other king. He has the power to forgive our sins. He has the power to bring life out of death. He is the hope of the world. You know, when I say that, I mean, you know, as a Christian, we get to practice bowing a lot. You never do it once for all because God is in the process of revealing to you that you're still in rebellion. Any of you discover he pulled back the veneer a little bit more on your life this week and it's like, oh, I thought I had done the better job. I thought that was over. No. And we get to bow before him. But this is what is so important. As we go through this study, you're going to find out that if you would be a person who will seek first his kingdom, you cannot do it apart from bowing your knee to the king. If you try, really what you're doing is seeking first your convenience. And you hope it matches up enough with righteousness that you can get away with it. The only problem is that is just slavery all over again. That is, that is you having to be in charge of your life. God doesn't say that. He, he literally gives this initiative. Christ comes and in His kingdom, He says, Seek first My kingdom and My righteousness. That you might have life, and that life more abundantly. And so what it demands is this crazy old English world. How many of you ever heard of this word, fealty? Do you know that when a knight would swear fealty to a king, it was a much bigger deal than, you have my sword. To swear fealty meant, my life is yours. You are now my sovereign Lord. I will do as you say. There is no relationship that has greater priority on me anymore. Not my wife, not my children, nothing. You are my king. You're my king. What you say is what is true. What you ask is what I give. You are my Lord and God, and I swear fealty to you. And I may trip in the process, but I will come back in repentance and acknowledge daily, you are my king. And there is no life outside of you. There is nothing in this world outside of you. Jesus, you're it. See, the problem in Christianity is you keep getting this sprinkled Jesus idea on your life and you wonder why, God, nothing's happening. Because he's not a genie. He's the king. And he stands before us with his arms open wide as they were opened on the cross and he's paid for your life and he says, will you bow? And will you let me show you what life is? It is not free from hard. It is not free from all these things. But it is with the confidence, assurance of the smile of the one who will rule forever. Amen? Amen? It doesn't start. I know I'm big and verbose and 
it starts so quietly. You go. You get alone. And I mean it, church. You get alone. Teenager, you listen to me. You get alone. You get by yourself. You get in a quiet room. You get alone. And you get down on your knees. And you say out loud, I am... I'm such a scuzzy servant. (laughs) But you are my king. And today, Jesus, I would serve you. Show me what it means. Help me today. And you begin to walk. And you know what's going to change? When we sing in this room, all hail the power of Jesus' name, there's going to be a little something extra in it, isn't there? Because we will be a people who believe it and are walking it out. Amen, church? We're down the road. We're going. The book of Matthew is unfolding, and we are going to discover the greatness of our King Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. Oh God, today, we are not great. We are nothing special. But we become of immense value because You are our King. God, today, someone's in this room who's listening to me, and when they think of bowing their knee before You, it scares them. Lord, to give up control in our life, to say we need You, is a frightening thing. Oh God, would we see that You are not just some fly-by-the-night, momentary Savior. You are the Son of God, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham, the One who is of old. You've checked all of the boxes and You've died for us. Oh God, would we today live like You're our King? I don't know where that's going to take this congregation today. Maybe it's going to take them uh, to repentance. Maybe it's a moment we've been living apart from Your authority. Oh God, be in that. May it be such a sweet moment of asking for forgiveness and going straighter, going the way You want us to go. Maybe it's going to be a moment of worship where we are suddenly, it dawns on us in the midst of our broken, You're in charge. In this broken moment, our God is working out His perfect plan. Would you do that? Maybe in the life of one of our young people, God. Oh God, that at this age they would bow their knee and declare their fealty. And what a difference. What a light is going to shine in the world because of that. Lord, you are our king. And we worship you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.